Well, you are most welcome to this talk. It is currently Monday the 5th of June, and for some strange reason, some of the world's leading doctors and scientists come on this channel to talk to us, to talk to you, of course, rather than to talk to me. So, Dr. Ross Jones, thank you very much for coming on the, on the, uh, on the programme. Thank you, John, for inviting me. Just tell us a little bit briefly about yourself, Ross. Why should we uh, listen to your opinions? Well, I'm a, a retired consultant paediatrician. I was 40 years in the NHS. I was director of women and children's services at my local hospital. Um, and I also, interestingly enough, I was involved in that role in pandemic planning in 2009 for the swine flu outbreak, uh, which was very different plans from what we subsequently landed up with. Um, but I had retired a few years back and at the beginning of the pandemic, I was invited to and, and re-signed up with the GMC. But fortunately, of course, children were barely affected by COVID and it was very obvious I wasn't needed for going back to clinical work. Um, so I've landed up um, looking at the pandemic plans and the management and all sorts of aspects in the same way that you have, I think, digging into literature. Um, and I'm a, a spokesperson for the Heart Organisation Health Advisory Recovery Team. And as well as being a lifelong clinician, you've also done research, you've got an MD and you're actually a fellow of the Royal College of uh, Physicians, I believe, as well. So that's a, it's a, it's a very uh, yeah. exalted um, yeah, medical recognition. Absolutely. So, so th thank you again for coming. Um, now, let's just clarify, Ross, have you been involved in paediatric vaccinations all of your career? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I led on vaccines. I, I, I ran the HIV clinic for children as well. Um, and we set up a neonatal BCG vaccination at the hospital where I worked during my time. And I had a clinic for giving actually MMR vaccines for children with, with egg allergy, but there was concerns about them having it in general practice. So we brought them into the clinic um, to do that. So yes, I've, I've always been um, recommending vaccines to, to my patients. But I have to say, as soon as the COVID uh, rollout began, I just felt very uneasy. I mean, I felt uneasy for adults, but particularly for children, because it was such a totally new technology. And so it was very obvious that they, for all they were saying it's safe and effective, they couldn't know it was safe because there was no data. Um, and so all they were saying was, I hope it's safe. And very early on, I was looking at the risk benefit balance. And obviously, if you're a person with a lot of risk factors for COVID, then you may think that an unknown, very new technology vaccine that has got poor knowledge of safety is a good bargain because you're worried about whether you're going to get through this winter. But if you're otherwise healthy, and particularly if you're a child, uh, it, it seemed to me quite reckless. And I think because I was a paediatrician, I really felt I had to speak out on that. The beginning of me being quite worried about this was when I was watching early evening news and I saw the AstraZeneca team at, in Oxford were advertising, this is in February 2021, they were advertising on early evening news for children aged 6 to 15 to join a trial of AstraZeneca. And I wrote immediately to Andrew Pollard because I'd worked with him in, in, in I was in the same region as him. Um, because I, I couldn't see how you could ethically start doing trials on children for a condition that barely affected them when you hadn't yet got the results of the long-term trials from the adults. Um, so I think that's when I first thought this is there's something totally, yeah, totally unethical going on here. And is, is this normal, Ross, that you would do a phase one clinical trial on children or would you normally do it on adults first? You would always do it on adults first. I mean, I've done quite a lot of paediatric research and newborn research was my special area of interest. And you can do trials on babies if it's for a condition that only babies have. So I, I did for my MD was all about babies with, um, you know, apnea of prematurity. Well, you can't treat adults for a condition of premature babies. But the mm. Nuremberg Treaty and then the Helsinki, Helsinki Agreement are very clear that for trials in children, it has to be for the child, the child has to potentially benefit from the, the test material. 
You have to be confident it's not going to harm them. And you have to say that I can't do this on adults in order to do it first on children or at the same time as, as on children. And for COVID, it was clear that it, to me that it didn't fulfill those criteria because it was obvious right from the word go from China. You know, I, I was sitting here feeling you know, anxious. So I ought to be back at work. And you know, I'm in my 70s, so I obviously was meant to be shield, you know, hiding away. So that was a bit of a dilemma. But it was very obvious that even in China, in the first of, we were seeing people collapsing in the street. Um, who knows about the quality of those photographs? But the, uh, they had no deaths in under 10s. And by the time it got to Italy, again, it was clearly a disease of the elderly. Um, and in every country that's looked at this, including the UK, the average age of death from COVID was actually slightly higher than the average age of death from all causes. So, you know, we've got an average age of death of 83 for COVID. And, and yet there was this clinical trial going on for the AstraZeneca vaccine uh, in children. The, the, as I remember, Ross, the, the original trials for the uh, Pfizer and Moderna vaccine were actually weren't conducted in children, were they? They were all conducted in adults. Yes, they were all adults. But the rollout for children didn't happen until after they'd done some children's trials. But when you look at the children's trials, they were very small I mean, the Pfizer trial, on which we based a rollout to children, had 1,131 children given the Pfizer vaccine and followed for a maximum of two months. Um, and now, to my mind, that's not any way to judge either safety or efficacy. It, it's just too small mm. and too short. Um, and it's quite different. If you've got a really sick patient in front of you, then you can, you know, in full discussion with parents and and... and all the pros and cons of what you could offer. You might take some drug that's been successful in adults and hasn't yet got much data in children, but you've got a baby that's probably going to die if you do nothing. And that is completely different from rolling out a vaccine to a healthy population. These are children who are not at risk from COVID. And how did you communicate your concerns and to whom did you communicate your concerns, Ross? Well, as I say, I started out by writing to Andrew Pollard who pointed out that he, although he is mm -hmm. chairman of the JCVI, he'd stepped aside for the COVID vaccines. So he wasn't on the COVID vaccine committee. But, you know, Adam Finn from Bristol is also on the JCVI and was one of the co-investigators for AstraZeneca. And he was definitely on the COVID committee. Um, and so I got back a reply, in effect, saying, hi, Ross, yes, you're right, we don't know about safety. And that's why we're doing the study, which to me was quite worrying. And ironically, it was less than a month after they gave AstraZeneca to the children in this study that the first death was reported in Denmark. And in Denmark, they withdrew AstraZeneca. They suspended it the, the next day and they then withdrew it for all under 50s because it was very clear that the risks, the side effects from this, for, for this vaccine induced from complications um, was more common the younger you were. So then we seem to just swap to thinking oh well let's use Pfizer for young adults. I haven't written anything um, mm. you know about general vaccination. I didn't really think that was my role as a paediatrician. But then when the Pfizer started applying for um, an FDA approval I thought oh my goodness and when they I went I was on the FDA you have these open panels and I went to the open panel and said I hope for the children of America that you don't approve it but if you do we at least may have the chance to use your children as gu our guinea pigs because we are not rolling it out at the moment and we had Matt Hancock and in fact um, Kate Bingham very clearly saying this is a vaccine for adults it's not for children it's for the over 50s initially or those with significant health vulnerabilities and then somehow they got onto this roller coaster that it was coming down to younger and younger adults. Um, and then I heard Adam Finn, as I say, who's, who's on the JCVI, he was reported in, in the papers saying, you know, as soon as we finish the rollout to adults, we must get to children because they'll be providing a source of infection. So in other words, we would be using children to protect adults. And that again is absolutely contrary to any civilised society. You can't do that. You just can't. 
um, use, use children to don't, don't, don't kill your granny, was the message, wasn't it? But it, yes, but was there any evidence that children were a source of infection and children no, were infecting all No, no. the evidence was really that actually, interestingly, there were quite a lot of studies from schools. Um, the evidence was that adults were more likely to pass it to children than the other way around. The evidence also, interestingly, was that teaching was a low-risk profession and that working with children and living with children is actually protective. So if you were working with children, you might have a slightly higher chance of catching COVID, but you had a lower chance of being hospitalised or dying. Presumably, I mean, as a paediatrician, I can, um, you know, understand that because if you're exposed day in, day out to kids with, you know, all infectious diseases, which you are, it's mm. a constant top up for your own immune system. So I never got ill when I was working, apart from my first job, I was ill within two days of starting and felt rather embarrassed because I thought they'd think I was a, you know, complete scrimshank. But after that, I never had a day off in, you know, decades. Um, so it, it's... Why, 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 why was that, Ross? What happened to your physiology to bring that change about? <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I, mean, I think, you, you know, you, you're constantly reminding your T-cells how to function. You're keeping your complement levels up. Um, you know, there's a lot about the immune system we don't understand. And I think, again, when you're talking about children, there was quite a lot of evidence early on that children had better innate immunity. I think people think children are vulnerable. And obviously, if you're a tiny preterm baby, you are very vulnerable to infections. But, you know, for example, talking about a novel virus, the coronavirus was going to be so dangerous because it was novel. But babies, every, every infection they re meet is novel, isn't it, by definition. And they cope. And they have done for millennia. So babies have a fantastically efficient system of meeting infections and working out how to fight them. Um, and I think we interfere yeah. with that at our peril, really, or their peril. Was there much discussion of this natural immunity um, in the early stages, or do you think there was an overemphasis on the, the, the necessity for vaccine or the perceived necessity for vaccine-induced immunity? It was slightly odd, wasn't it? Because right back at the beginning, in March 2020, at the, just before lockdown, Patrick Balance was on the you know, daily uh, press briefing saying that we would, you know, if we were, for example, going to go inside for three weeks was for the over 70s were to stay in for 12 weeks, but everybody else was only going to go in for three weeks just to flatten the curve, just to make sure the NHS wasn't going to fall over. Um, but that basically he was saying, really, we're going to be dependent on the majority of healthy people catching this virus and building up natural immunity and herd immunity so that by the time the elderly came out of their isolation, there would be a lot less COVID around because most people would have already had it. Um, and then some, and at that time, they were saying that a vaccine might take two or three years. And I don't think anybody could have kept us locked down for two or three years. But of course, they then got their skates on and somehow persuaded us that we had to keep in lockdown. And if you remember, more lockdowns came in the, the, the next winter. And then the, re, the reprieve from those was targeted around the dates of the vaccination rollout. So the first thing to open, schools could only open once all the over 70s had been vaccinated with their first dose. And then it would be, you know, then the next thing would be when they'd had their second dose or when the over 50s had had a dose and so on. Um, and, you know, most things got back to normal, were targeted to be back to normal by May or June 2021, by which time all the over 50s and everybody with health vulnerabilities had been vaccinated. And yes, things did open up, but the vaccine programme continued to be pushed and pushed with mandates, pushed with bribery, pushed with things which in my entire career I have never witnessed anything like. You know, would you like a pizza if you go? Would you like to set up a pop-up clinic at Carlton Athletic Stadium and give a free football ticket to the first thousand people to turn up that day? Another pop-up clinic at Thorpe Park. They had a child collapse, a teenager collapse there, which had to be helicoptered off. That was a bit embarrassing. Um, but, you know, this is not the way to manage a public health crisis. It really isn't. To terrify people, as we've heard from Matt Hancock, deliberately, we need to scare the pants off him, off them, was his phrase. And as you know from, I, mean, I don't know if you've talked to Laura Dodsworth, but 
her book on the state of fear, she's interviewed people from the spy B, the nudge unit, um, and they had no exit plan. They thought we needed to be more frightened to make us more well-behaved and more compliant, but they never thought about how damaging that is. It's damaging for the immune system, quite apart from damaging for the um, uh, you know, economy and, and everybody's mental health. Um, but they never thought, how are we going to then undo the fear? And I find it very sad, even now, three years on, I still see people around wearing masks, and you think, does that mean they're going to live the rest of their lives terrified of this hidden foe <laughs> out there? Yeah. I was going to say, I contacted a Andrew Pollard about the AstraZeneca, but then obviously that wasn't going to go to children. Um, and then when it got past the point that the FDA had approved the Pfizer, that was when I wrote to the MHRA and I had a letter, which I think I've, you, I've sent you a copy of, which was signed by 50 experienced um, health professionals and academics. I mean, for example, Professor Carol Sikora, who a well-known professor of oncology, who was actually, I think, our oncology czar, cancer czar at one time, and has also worked for the WHO. We had a professor of microbiology, professor of genomics, professor of risk management. I mean, you know, this was not just a random load of loonies, I don't think. Um, retired consultant from public health, um, somebody from Public Health Wales, equally recently retired. Um, uh, you know, surgeons, physicians, anaesthetists, currently working in intensive care consultants who were really concerned that this shouldn't be rushed out to children. And we wrote this letter and I contacted the MHRA a week later and spoke to June Rain's secretary and she was saying, well, you know, these things take a long time. And we were very keen that they read our letter before they authorised this. Because I know how hard it is for people to say they got it wrong. And we were aiming to put this to them before they made this decision. It had, uh, you know, 75 references. And we, of course, got no reply. And we eventually got a reply in the set beginning of June, two hours after they had publicly announced that they were authorising the use of the vaccine for children. That didn't seem like a coincidence, and the letter they sent basically said, oh, don't worry, we've looked at it all, and it's safe and effective. But they have to publish the data they've looked at, and the data on the website from the MHRA was only the Pfizer trials. There was no information apart from Pfizer. Now, Pfizer are the people wanting this approval. So if you only ask Pfizer, will you really get a balanced view? And obviously the questions we then sent a supplementary letter, the following, well, about two days later, I sent another one saying, really, how um, have you looked at risk? Have you looked at the Israeli data? Because, because these other countries had started early, we were already seeing reports from Israel, reports from the US, um, about myocarditis, particularly in adolescent boys. Um, I did a conference call with two teams that I know the JCVI were in conference calls with, but the authors of the papers were extremely helpful, and we had Zoom meetings, and I have access to the data that they shared with the JCVI. So I know the JCVI saw this data. So uh, anyway, to, to cut a long story short, when I sent the next round of letters back to the JCVI, I copied them originally and they'd said, oh, it's not up to us, you need to you know, write to the MHRA, which we've done. So I then wrote back to them and said, look, the MHRA have now agreed that this could be used um, under conditional marketing authorization, but you need to be aware they have not done their safety um, work. So if you are going to later recommend it, you have to look at the safety first. And if you look at the minutes of the JCPI meetings through the summer of 2021, they were obviously under a lot of pressure. We had teachers' unions saying they could set up school hubs to get all this done before the children broke up in July, and still the JCVI didn't respond. And then in July, they actually then announced that they did not recommend this for routinely for healthy under-18s because the balance of benefit and risk was too close to call. But they would only recommend it for children with known health vulnerabilities. They could already get the vaccine anyway, because all you had to do 
the College of Paediatrics have been very reassuring to parents as a whole, and they said, if your child is at serious risk, talk to your paediatrician, and they can go through the whole thing with you, and if, if you both think you want a vaccine without a lot of data, then, you know, it can be arranged. But suddenly it was being pushed to go out, and then within 48 hours of that announcement that it wasn't for healthy under-18s, they um, had another emergency meeting, and the minutes of that say it was called at the request of the chief medical officer for them to reconsider their decision. In other words, they'd given the wrong answer. So they then had another meeting in which they sort of said, oh, well, okay, why don't we give it to 16 and 17s? And just one dose rather than two doses, because most of the heart inflammation was after the second dose. But even that wasn't good enough. And then they met again, and eventually in September, they said that they still didn't feel that on balance it was good enough for health. But if the chief medical officers wanted to look at other societal aspects, such as schooling, then they could do so. Um, but, um, but originally we got down to vaccinating five-year-olds, didn't we? Oh, well, it's now rolled out to naught to fours with health vulnerabilities as of this week. So, and I think that's quite odd because given that this has been around now for three years, if they'd really thought they needed it, they would have somehow expedited. But so why now when we are stopping? I mean, as of the end of this month, I think all routine vaccination um, will be stopping. It's never gone on to the national mm -hmm. schedule. Well, it did, but only for about a fortnight before they got so many people up in arms, they quietly dropped it off again. But it's, um, mm. yeah, so now, I don't know, and it includes, if you look at the, the categories of disability, it includes all children on the learning disability register. Well, that's quite odd. You know, it, fair enough, if you've got complex cardiac disease, chronic lung disease, you've been in and out of intensive care for previous virus infections that tend to tip you into pneumonia and so on, then you may well be a family that would be thinking this would be a good idea. But for children with learning disabilities, it seems rather strange, to put it mildly. It, it, it really does. And that idea that the chief medical officer didn't like the, uh, the results of the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation and sent them back to redo their homework is really quite, quite, quite bizarre. Yes. I, I remember, and, and you, get, you getting that letter two hours after the authorisation was given. Uh, yes, we got, we got the reply from the MHRA two hours after the authorisation. And then, as I say, I then wrote again, just saying, look, you know, because the, their reply didn't answer any of our questions, really. And I said, you know, bullet points, mm. these are the questions you really, we need to know. What, how have you considered risk? What number needed to vaccinate, mm -hmm. etc. All these basic questions. What do you know about the, the pharmacology of this? Do you know whether children will make more spike protein because they're very efficient? Or will they make less? You know, we've no idea. How long will they make it? Where does it go? Um, we know it's being concentrated in the ovaries and testis, but are you quite confident that means it can't possibly, by any stretch of the imagination, affect their fertility um, in future? So there were so many unknowns. And how could, they be, I, how, how could they be so certain it wouldn't? Well, they can't, and that's, that's what gets me. I mean, I'd love to be wrong and find it had all turned out to be safe. But sadly, that's not the way things are appearing. We're now at a situation where we've got, you know, a large number of excess deaths that still aren't properly explained. We had excess deaths in boys aged 15 to 19 in the second half of 2021. And we took the government, we went, had a judicial review, we went to court. And in court, the Office for National Statistics had to respond because we presented these documents in court and they agreed that there was a statistically significant increase in all-cause mortality for boys aged 15 to 19 in the second half of that year. But they said they weren't planning to investigate unless the signal became stronger. And you thought, you know, there were an extra 100 plus deaths. You know, 100... So a few, a few, de a few deaths don't matter, Ross. It's just, it's just well, if there's a lot of deaths, it becomes a problem, yeah, is it? Yeah. Well, because they're young, obviously very few die. So instead of 300 dying, 400 died. Well, that's quite a significant extra. So anyway, just you mentioning the CMO, and I thought him demanding an extra meeting within 48 hours was quite worrying. But I thought no more about it. And over the mm. years, we've gone on writing letters. Um, but I went 
I landed up contributing, and the reason I got in touch with you yesterday was I saw you were talking about this counter disinformation unit. Yeah. Now I did know about the C C D U, yeah. Yes, yeah, the C D U. So Silka um, Carlo oh. had set up something called Big Brother Watch, and she'd done a load of freedom of information investigations, and she had discovered about this unit, which was not public knowledge. Um, I think it's existed for a while, but it, 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 I think it was originally set up really for, it's, it's under the umbrella of the Department for Culture, Media and Sport, which includes online media, because it's media. Um, and I think originally it was set up to look at counter-terrorism and, you know, grooming, well, it could be grooming for child sexual offences or it could be grooming for going into terrorism or whatever. So that's the, that was the sort of original understanding and also they were looking at foreign interference, etc. Um, but obviously... All, she all was reasonable aims. Yeah, so she was quite shocked to find people like David Davis, senior Conservative politician, ex-Cabinet Minister, had been reported to the counter-disinformation unit. Um, I do remember him being a little outspoken about lockdowns, um, and then he spoke up about vitamin D. Well, you know, that's really terrorist stuff, isn't it? I mean, it just, it, it all felt very odd. Anyway, because I contributed to their, the fund for their investigation, I got invited to the launch meeting. So and I got a copy of their Ministry of Truth document, all those sort of black and quite scary. And of course, in it, it included somebody who'd signed one of my letters, who had, had only found out because he was the next item on a list that they got sent. It, he hadn't asked, but he turned out to be on it. So then they told you how to find out. So you can do this subject access review. And there were two teams. There was the Cabinet Office, had a rapid response unit, and they were in daily contact with the CDU, so they said, um, to absolutely crush any dissent um, and any disinformation. So anyway, I sent off my two letters, one to them and one to the DCMS. So the Cabinet Office said they didn't have any data on me, which is probably because the Rapid Response Unit was disbanded in July last year. So maybe they had had data, but they've disbanded it. So they haven't got data now, so that's good. But when it came to um, the DCMS, I got back this neat little thing. I don't think we can probably see it. Oh, yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Is it in mirror writing? It is, isn't it? Uh, it no, no, on the final copy, it would be in normal text. Oh, good. OK. Well, there it is. It's just said what I've got. It's a di it said that it, that's who I am and that's my, my qualifications right. and my job title. But the date of referral mm -hmm. was the 10th of June 2021. And you have to be told who you were referred by. And it, I was referred by the DHSC. And it was a letter regarding that, 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 that they forwarded. Um, open letter. So the, the Department of Health and Social Care yeah. reported you to the counter disinformation unit. Yeah. So two days after we sent just a incredible. copy of our letter. So one gov to one government team. department reporting you to another government. Yeah, yeah. And I think you yeah. know I, I I know several of the other authors on this letter who have sent in these subject access reviews and they've had an identical thing back um, saying that yes they've been reported. Um, I just. It's the disconnect between politicians, the public, the medical profession, the, the whole way in which normally one would have open discussion and sharing of ideas, double checking. You know, if you're in a serious situation, you want lots of heads in, in don't you, to start thinking, mm. what can we do? Rather than closing the doors, and getting this very narrow team. I mean, Sage had a lot of mathematicians, mathematicians and modelers. I don't think they had a, a full-time immunologist who might have been very useful. Um, and all along, they they just shut out any counter information, and did and never respond. They never respond with, well, here's an article. This is why we are saying this because this article shows it, and the article you've sent us is wrong because. Of that, they never pick holes in the articles we've sent them. They never send us other articles 
to show us the error of our ways, all they do is try and discredit us and say that we're mad anti-vaxxers or we're rabid right-wingers or, you know, it's sort of, it, it's all very, very strange. Mm. Did you make attempts to contact politicians directly? Yes, I mean, with heart, when we first set up, we had been writing a weekly newsletter and we were sending it to MPs and all MPs received it. And we were, over those first few weeks, we were getting more um, people opening them and um, we got about, you know, at least 60 or 70 MPs who were reading them every week and others who were sort of dipping in and out. Mm -hmm. um, and then a, one of the other things which happened, which I think is linked into this counter disinformation unit, is that the heart um, group workspace got hacked and it was a very professional hack. They, somebody got into, through somebody else's email address, I think they sort of worked their way into our system. And it was a system with lots of different channels because it was a working group. So we'd have one for people who were looking into vaccinations, looking into lockdowns, looking into face masks, looking into child, um, children's issues, educational issues, mental health issues. They were all different work streams, data, and then there was the, the sort of writing group and so on. And this hacker hung around in the back of the heart, um, it's a system, uh, for about a week. He went into every one or she, every one of the streams that was there, and was obviously reading and downloading stuff, but didn't write anything, which is a bit odd, because most people who join, they'll say, oh, hi there, you know, I'm a, an anaesthetist from Bolton, or, uh, you know, because we've got a lot of medical people on board. Um, but it, then they just suddenly, I think somebody on our admin team thought, I don't know who this person is. They had a sort of name that was the sort of, it isn't a real name, you know, but that, which annoys me on Twitter, all these people who use phony names. Um, but then um, the next day we got a, an email from a group called Logically AI saying that they had been given all this data. So they were not the hackers, but they had been given all this data and they were intending to publish it on their website the following day. Um, and do we have any comments? And then of course they've published bits which were completely out of context, little snippets of this and that that were private conversations, mm. you know, somebody might say, I mean, there was a whole load, I was getting people worrying about, there was something about whether there might be graphene on the nose swabs, and there were parents worrying about this. And I put a question into the group, just saying, I'd seen something on Twitter, which I didn't, I didn't think was probably reliable. And I just said, is this something we should be looking at or not? And the answer was, no, I don't think there's any evidence for this, you know, we shouldn't be looking at it. But they didn't, pub they didn't publish the reply, they only published the bit which is me saying, oh, should we look at graphene on the nose swabs, you know? And, oh, look at these mad people, they think there's gra graphene on the nose swabs. Um, it, so, it, and it, it was interesting because it, we got a police investigation and, and a, a you know, URL number, it was an illegal hack, so sharing that information was illegal. And logically AI have had a large government grant for supporting the CDU in their work. They are uh, an artificial intelligence um, internet company who are then trawling through Twitter and Facebook and so on and streaming stuff over to the CDU, as far as I know. And so it again seemed quite odd that they were all there and ready and whoever was hacking knew who to take it to and who would be interested in publishing it. Um, and it's still unresolved, we never got to the bottom of who the hacker was or um, any prosecution, but it made quite a difference. It was sad because I think we were making quite a lot of progress with a lot of politicians and suddenly they got really scared because they read the bad press and not the good press um, and they wouldn't engage. Yeah, th this hack basically broke the link between the country's doctors and the country's politicians. Yeah, I would say so, yeah. Do you feel it's a problem generally at the moment that... that, that Doctors aren't allowed to think for themselves. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I, I think, um, it was interesting, I, I, I got some, a uh, friend was getting budesonide from their doctor, which has been recommended, that it came out in a, a randomised trial from Oxford, um, and it, the doctor was saying, but I'm not allowed to give it because it's not on the NHS recommendations for COVID, but I could give you a private prescription if you like. 
So he could do that. He could give a private... Well, luckily, it's cheap. He could give a private prescription. But he said he was not allowed to prescribe a drug that had been shown in a randomised trial to work and was in widespread use for, you know, asthma and things. I mean, it was a drug he was familiar with and would have been perfectly happy to prescribe, um, but he wasn't allowed to. And, you know, I think things like the vitamin D story is very odd because the hospital where I work at, we've, we've got a large Indian subcontinent population and we've had a lot of vitamin D deficiency related to, you know, living in a northern sunless climate. Um, and... The, um, one of the cardiologists there, they did a study very early on in, in March, April 2020. Everybody coming in with COVID was getting their vitamin D levels measured. And they then looked at what happened to people by their vitamin D level and whether they landed up going, just staying on the ward and going home, or whether they landed up needing oxygen or going into intensive care or dying. And there was a very clear relationship that the the lower your vitamin D, the worse you did. And the people with vitamin D levels over about 50 nanograms per mil were fine. And there haven't been deaths with if you've got a high vitamin D level. Now, why did our local authority then not go rushing out to sort of push this? It's cheap as anything. You can buy a 180, you know, tablets, three months supply in a supermarket for less than you could go and buy a cappuccino from a coffee shop. Um, but we never have pushed it, and the NICE guidance, even now, still has the dose, which I was taught as a medical st student for bone health, for stopping you getting rickets. Um, but it doesn't have the proper dose that we now know is related to immune function. Um, and T-cell function is dependent on good vitamin D. And that would have been such an easy thing to do in that first summer, get people out, we, you know, all this hiding indoors, we should have been out and about, getting the sunshine, going for long country walks rather than being told you, you can only go out for an hour. And we should have been really pushing people to take vitamin D supplements as they came into the, the autumn of 2020, so that, okay, we maybe, have, we maybe were ill-prepared for the first wave, but come the second wave, there was lots more could have been done to reduce deaths, I think. And there was just no focus on things like vitamin D, vitamin C, zinc, um, exercise, losing weight, controlling blood pressure, controlling diabetes, all of these things that optimise the efficiency of the immune system. It all seemed to be, no, you need the vaccine. I, don't, I, I never heard Chris Whitty talking about any of these things, as far as I can remember. No, no. Well, I, mean, I think you look at Anthony Fauci in the States, who's run their National Institutes of Health um, for the last, what, 40 plus years, and during his time in office, someone was pointing out that the American public, I'm afraid, have become less and less healthy, um, and I think we're not far behind. Um, and it, it is sad because I think anything to do with general health would have not only improved your outcome for COVID, but would have improved your outcome for lots of other diseases too. You know, uh, you know every winter, people who are dying of, of respiratory viruses are people who are more frail or you know and you're at higher risk if you're diabetic etc diabetes type 2 diabetes is a preventable disease but we don't prevent it we put people on treatment and, and treatment that they can then take for years um, and don't really tell them that if they lost two or three stone they would lose their diabetes mm -hmm. medically um we we know that the the natural immune system can produce immunity to to billions of different types of antigen in the environment was there anything that was different about SARS coronavirus 2 that indicated it wouldn't generate a natural immune response the same as any other of the milieu of viruses that we live in oh no absolutely not John I think one particularly interesting paper I saw was from the Far East um, I think it was Singapore and they looked back at blood donors, they'd got stored blood from 2019, before the pandemic arrived, and they of course had had SARS-CoV-1 in 2003, and they had already mm. still got, they'd still got good active immunity to SARS-CoV-1, and that was by then 16 years later. And moreover, they had cross immunity for SARS-CoV-2. So there was a lot of assumption that when the Far East did rather well, it must be because they were so much more proficient about masks and social distancing, because it was sort of in their culture. 
But actually, um, it could also have been because they'd been had more exposure to SARS-CoV-1, and it was quite a similar virus. Mm -hmm. It, it wasn't novel in that And, and the, other, the, the other four coronaviruses that are in circulation anyway, in, 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 they're endemic in the UK. Yeah, so you would just say it was a cousin of yeah. another virus. I mean, it clearly was very nasty, I think, at mm. the beginning. And I think the other thing I've been interested oh, yeah. is how, how little anger there's been at where this virus came from. You know, there was a lot of discussion about it all coming from a wet meat market in China. But actually, more and more evidence has come out to suggest it highly likely came from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Um, but again, another bit of censorship. I um, have been in contact with Professor Dal Gleish from St George's and he and a colleague in Norway, they did a genomic study very early on um, and looked at the virus and said it was too many changes away from the circulating back viruses and they thought it was highly likely, and they, they actually found specific markers in it that showed it had been spliced in some way. They were pretty sure it was a manipulated virus. And they had difficulty getting the paper published, and eventually it got published in Nature. And within a week, there was a letter in The Lancet with a whole load of professors on it saying that this is completely wrong, it's a conspiracy theory, it's nonsense. Um, and then at a much later stage, somebody hacking some Ian... Um, into the, uh, Dr. Fauci's emails, found email, and it, this is now all public, but emails between Dr. Fauci and Sir Jeremy Farrar, who here, who was head of the Wellcome Trust and is now working for the WHO, um, saying, look, please, Jeremy, can you take this down? We need to take it down. Now, why? Well, of course, one reason could be that they were particularly worried not to have any publicity about it possibly coming from the lab because actually the Americans had been funding the work in this lab. And they'd started doing that years earlier when actually, as I understand it, Barack Obama had been a bit worried about this so-called gain of function research and saying, well, what if there was an accidental escape from the lab and I don't think you should be doing it? And he told the um, NIH team that they'd got to stop doing gain of function work yeah. in the States. So what do they do? They shipped it to a lab in China, which is not notorious for its good governance or its transparency. Um, and of course, when the WHO came in to investigate, they cleaned everything up and there was nothing to be seen and they didn't you know, um, play the game with them. But it, it, I don't think it was China on, the, on their own. I think China, I think with American funding, probably did this. But at the end of it, it they did create a virus which had a quite um, you know, some quite unpleasant effects, and then we managed it very badly. Um, because instead of giving really good health protection to the people who were most vulnerable, we clobbered everybody. And also we yeah. took away, you were saying earlier on about not being able to use your clinical judgment, and, and, and it was medicine by, by robot, really, is that we told GPs yeah. to shut their services. And I, I couldn't understand that. I was willing to go back to work as a 72-year-old. If the paediatricians had died, I would have been there with my sleeves rolled up. Luckily, it didn't come to that. But the idea that GPs were being yeah. told, oh, no, you mustn't see patients. I mean, my brother-in-law was really quite unwell in the first um, wave. And I was wanting to go and see him. And he was saying, no, 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 you mustn't. And, you know, there's my sister saying, and he had a temperature for a fortnight. But not, no question of seeing his GP, getting given maybe some antibiotics an oxygen sats meter, you know, he, he, he recovered. But, you know, there were people I know who died at home because they were too frightened to go to hospital and they were told not to contact their GP. Um, and that, to me, was a real dereliction of duty by, by a large pr proportion of the medical profession in general practice, in primary care. I mean, medically... As a as a lifelong doctor, do you think it's useful to be able to see your patient, to be able to palpate your patient, to get make a proper assessment? Oh, I do think so. I mean, it's interesting when you used to get the annual report from the Medical Defence Union. They have all these horror stories, and the the failure to examine the patient was the key, you know, common thread. I I, I have had a colleague um, who who um, had a friend with a perforated appendix, and they just run their GP with abdominal pain, I mean this was early on in Covid, um, were told well you know just drink plenty of fluids and take some paracetamol. 
But you can't diagnose abdominal pain without putting a hand on the belly. You can't. And I've just this week heard of somebody, an 80 something, and the worry is that they still haven't gone back to normal. So I've just learned of a, a, a friend who in their 80s has died of a strangulated hernia. They got severe abdominal pain. They, their partner rang the GP and the GP said, oh, we don't need to see you, um, and didn't see him. And I don't suppose he'll see you. Well, I mean, he won't because he's dead, but I don't suppose his partner will either because they're in their 80s and, you know, who knows? But he, let, he stayed at home for another two days with the pain getting worse and worse and then eventually went to hospital, by which time he got gangrenous bowel and he, being 85, didn't stand major surgery, but he might well have stood minor surgery, which if he'd just had the hernia untwisted at the beginning, um, I, think, I think it's medicine sort of slightly lost its way, yeah. really. So a patient with a, an acute appendicitis, within a second or two of you putting your hands on their tummy, you, you, you can tell, can't you, what, what yeah, is a peritonitis or not? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And you don't wait for them to get a perforated yeah. um, peritonitis. No, no, of course not. You would move, move, <laughs> move much. And, and again, but again, even in early inflammation of the appendix, you're going to be able to tell straight away from the from, from the guarding of the abdomen. It's uh, but, but you can't do that over the phone. You can't, I think there's a lot you miss. You can't really tell somebody's colour very well. You can't see their gait, just the way they walk into your room, you know. Um, you can tell a lot yeah. when you meet somebody face to face. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you want to take this question on or not, Ros, but do you think there's um, the amount, the, the, the research that is done, do you think that is skewed by the way that large institutions are funded? I think it probably is. Uh, I mean, I think the amount of data that's come out over the last three years has been enormous to the point where it's, it's very difficult to keep tabs on everything. There's just been so many publications. But I think the, the underlying funding will affect the type of research, but it also it seems to affect the conclusions. I and mean, the number of papers I've read where it looks like they've just shown a major side effect from the vaccine. For example, myocarditis. There was a paper about myocarditis in young people. In They did a, pro, a you know, forward-going prospective study of school children in Thailand, and they were given a questionnaire, and they were brought back for blood tests regularly, um, and it, it found an extremely worrying level of... One in 43 of them had sub sort of subclinical myocarditis where the blood test showed an abnormality between day one and day three and five, seven. Um, but at the end, the conclusion was something like, well, this could be very useful for, you know, warning people about, you know, managing vaccine-induced myocarditis. It didn't seem to be saying, actually, we shouldn't be giving this vaccine to these children. And I've seen quite a few like that. There was one from Israel looking at sperm count and sperm count dropped. They, they were sperm donors and the sperm count dropped after the vaccine and it was had gone up a bit by five months but it wasn't back to normal and they were saying oh you know it was fine it was on recovery but I think if I was a young man and I realised that my sperm count had dropped significantly at three months post vaccine and that by, at five months post vaccine it still wasn't quite back to where it should be but there again, it didn't, it didn't come to any conclusions, except saying, oh, you know, some more, more data is required. But as far as I know, nobody's done the more mm. data. Well, I think more data is always required. I think that's, 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 that's one of these things that is always, uh, absolutely always true. But it, it does seem sometimes when you're reading a paper that the conclusions are, it's almost like it's been written by someone else. Of course, we can't know that for sure. Um, just before we finish, uh, Ross, what, 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 one question. Can you just summarise for us why you think SARS coronavirus 2 causes less severe disease in children compared to uh, older adults? Well, I mean, most respiratory viruses are much milder in children than adults. Most, most illnesses are milder in children than adults, full stop. Um, they've got a very good immune system um, and they've got a healthy pair of lungs and... I think it's just probably general health, really. Um, their innate immune system, mm. which is their, the cellular function and so on, and the mucosal function is very e efficient. Um, so that's probably the, the main reason. 
But you know, me, if you get chicken pox in childhood, it's quite a mild disease. If you get chicken pox as an adult, it can be really quite nasty. So I, 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 it may not be any more complicated than that. And they haven't got yeah. all the comorbidities. Yeah, there's a lot of precedent. They're talking about children being mild, but of course, mm. most healthy adults have had this mildly too. Mm. Um, you know, I, and I think if you are, you know, significantly overweight with diabetes and hypertension and so on, you are at greater risk. But obviously, the older you are, the risk goes up. But a lot of that is because age is a marker for comorbidities. So if you're 70, you're more likely to have other illnesses. It's why, you know, having having babies mm. late is more risky than younger, partly because, you know, women in their 40s are more likely already to have high blood pressure before the pregnancy, which then gets made worse in pregnancy mm. than if you're a 20-year-old. Mm. So mm. I think it's, it's probably yeah. around that. So they haven't had time to develop all the rather nasty, mostly self-induced comorbidities that we all have mm. because we lead a pretty unhealthy lifestyle. Mm. Indeed. Dr. Jones, thank you so much for that. And I'm just looking at your letters now. Um, 17th of May 2021, uh, June 2021, you, your mind and your medical experience penetrated this problem much earlier than many, uh, and indeed much earlier than I did. So um, I think a lot of people would uh, um, admire your level of uh, early analysis on that. What and uh, thank you for, for your insights. And... Yeah. What I would love to see is somebody explain what part of our letter was disinformation. Because that's, yeah. you know, that we've been reported to the counter disinformation unit and nobody has pointed to anything in the letters that was incorrect. If you can persuade somebody to tell you, you can get back to me with the answer because I don't know what it is. I will do, and and we can we, we can put links to all these letters, can't can't we, Ross? So we can yeah, absolutely, please pe do. People can read them for themselves. Yeah, amazing. Let's see if we get a response to that. Of course, we will report back. But but for now, uh, you've given us a lot of your evening. So thank you very much, Dr. Jones, uh, lifelong paediatrician. Thank you. Thank you, John.